Cyanotic Congenital Cardiac Defects, Physiology of Cyanosis by Dr. Thomas Kulik. My name is uh, Tom Kulik. I'm a pediatric cardiologist and cardiac intensivist at the Children's Hospital Boston. Uh, this will be part one of a two-part uh, series on, the, phys on uh, the physiology, management, and evaluation of cyanotic congenital cardiac defects. Uh, we will uh, be speaking today in this lecture primarily about the physiology of cyanosis, and we will include a few types of cyanotic defects. Diagnosis and therapy are primarily discussed in a, sub a separate lecture. Introduction. I should start the lecture out by saying, you know, cyanosis is really the bluish color of the skin and mucous membranes due to um, approximately five grams or more of deoxygenated hemoglobin in the capillaries. Uh, cyanosis can be due to low arterial oxygen saturation. That's the dangerous form of cyanosis, you might say, but low cardiac output and venous stasis can also result in, in uh, cyanosis. We're not so much interested in those uh, today. And so what we're really going to be talking about primarily is arterial hypoxemia. I've put down on the slide, this is an arterial saturation, I suppose technically of less than about 95% or so. But what constitutes hypoxemia is actually pretty um, variable. There are some normal babies with a little bit of extra lung water or atelectasis that may have low 90 saturations for a period of time that are obviously normal uh, for all prat practical purposes. On the other hand, there are certain forms of cyanotic heart disease that have a considerable amount of pulmonary blood flow that may actually have saturations uh, well into the 90s. And so it's hard to define hypoxemia with any one given number when one is trying to discuss the whole range of causes of uh, cyanosis, especially yeah, with congenital cardiac defects. There are basically three fundamental causes of cyanosis. The first is desaturated pulmonary venous blood, that is to say lung disease. I'll refer to that as pulmonary cyanosis. The second cause is increased pulmonary vascular resistance, causing right to left shunting across a patent ductus arteriosus or a patent foramen ovale in the atrial septum. This is seen in babies and pretty much only in babies and is known as persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. The third cause of cyanosis, of course, are certain forms of congenital cardiac defects, and we will focus primarily on that for today's lecture. Pulmonary cyanosis. I'd like to briefly say a few words about the first two causes of cyanosis. Pulmonary cyanosis in uh, babies, and to some extent older patients as well, is primarily caused by RDS, pneumonia, uh, severe atelectasis, although mild atelectasis rarely causes true cyanosis. Uh, a normal chest x-ray pretty much rules out pulmonary cyanosis. Um, there's actually one exception to that, and that is to say patients with arteriovenous, pulmonary arteriovenous malformations can have cyanosis on the basis of lung disease, but which is not apparent on chest x-ray. But that's a very rare entity, and that's going to almost never show up uh, in, uh, in the newborn. Uh, increased inspired oxygen uh, concentration generally uh, much improves or eliminates cyanosis with lung disease. I'll say more about that um, uh, when we get to the sections on management and evaluation in the second part of this lecture. Persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. Persistent um, pulmonary hypertension of the newborn is due, um, uh, is, uh, causes hypoxemia due to right to left shunting at the atrial level or across the PDA due to very high pulmonary vascular resistance. It can occur with otherwise normal appearing lungs or in the um, setting of lung disease, especially meconium aspiration syndrome. The increased uh, pulmonary vascular resistance in PPHN is due to uh, vasoconstriction and is at least with true PPHN, meaning not another condition such as alveolar capillary dysplasia. 
uh, with what we generally refer to as true PPHN, uh, generally is reversible within a few days. And most patients, after having had this reversed, have no uh, subsequent um, uh, uh, manifestations of increased resistance. This is what I like to refer to as the um, natural history of the pulmonary circulation, or the pulmonary vascular resistance in the pulmonary circulation. On the y-axis is plotted the ratio of pulmonary to systemic vascular resistance, and on the x-axis is the age of the person. And as you'll note, the, the B stands for birth. Prior to birth, the ratio of pulmonary to systemic vascular resistance is exceedingly high. It's somewhere around 10 to 1, depending upon what assumptions you make about pulmonary blood flow. Uh, after the baby is born and takes a f uh, uh, the first few breaths, the uh, pulmonary vascular resistance plummets. And actually, within the first two or three weeks after uh, birth, the ratio has gone from 10 to 1 to about 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 to 1. Uh, a massive fall in resistance. Babies that have PPHN have a substantial fall in resistance at birth, but not nearly as much as a normal patient, as you can see in the um, a pink curve. And uh, it takes a period of time for this to resolve, uh, and the babies need to be supported during this period of time. Uh, this is a diagram uh, that uh, shows um, the levels of right-to-left shunting in babies with uh, PPHN. There can be right-to-left shunting across the patent foramen ovale, which is almost always present in a newborn. Uh, there can also be right-to-left shunting across the ductus arteriosus because pulmonary resistance is actually higher than aortic resistance. As you can see, if the, uh, if the shunting is predominantly right to left across the ductus, um, because this blood that shunts right to left across the ductus heads south, goes to the descending, descending aorta, there may be a differential in saturations, the, left or the right arm being considerably higher than the legs. Uh, and that's characteristic of patients with uh, PPHN. Uh, I should notice that there's also intrapulmonary shunting if the patient has lung disease, such as meconium aspiration syndrome. Congenital heart defects. Shunting. Okay, let's move on now to the main focus of the lecture, and that's uh, congenital heart defects. Hypoxemia, or cyanosis, is due to mixing of systemic venous blood, which is blue, of course, with pulmonary venous blood. That's the fundamental cause of hypoxemia. And there are two uh, reasons, basically, that red and blood, uh, blue blood can mix. One is shunting, and the other is simple mixing. Let's talk about shunting first. You know, these are um, uh, diagrams of uh, two types of heart. The heart on the left has a ventricular septal defect, the heart on the right, an atrial septal defect. And as you can see, in the case of the VSD, in some cases, uh, patients with VSDs will have left to right shunting. That is to say, blue, uh, red blood from the left ventricle will be ejected across the VSD into the lungs. Or patients with atrial septal defects will have uh, pulmonary venous red blood go across the atrial septal opening into the right atrium. That's left to right shunting. On the other hand, one can have uh, right to left shunting where blood flows from the right ventricle across the VSD into the aorta, or from the right atrium into the left atrium. So the question is, uh, what determines the direction and magnitude of shunting? And basically, the answer is very simple. In the case of ventricular septal defects, or, eight, or um, a patent ductus arteriosus, it's roughly the ratio of systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance that determines the direction of shunting. If the resistance to blood flow in the lungs is higher than the body, then blood will tend to go right to left. If, on the other hand, is as normally the case, resistance in the body is higher than the lungs, um, uh, body, uh, blood will tend to go left to right. Simply, um, pulmonary and systemic vascular resistances that are operative here. If you take, for example, the um, case of a heart with tetralogy of flow. Basically, with tetralogy, there's a large ventricular septal defect. 
and then there's narrowing at the pulmonary valve and below the pulmonary valve. The reason that there's right to left shunting in tetralogy of flow is not that there's high pulmonary vascular resistance. In fact, these patients have normal pulmonary vascular resistance, but that there is increased re resistance to blood flow out the right ventricle and into the pulmonary artery due to the subpulmonary and the pulmonary narrowing. So an additional reason for right to left shunting with a ventricular septal defect is actually uh, obstruction to outflow of the blood from the ventricle into the pulmonary artery. Now, the situation with atrial septal defects is somewhat different. The reason um, the um, uh, shunting pattern with atrial septal defects is due to the relative compliances of the two ventricles and not due to pressure differentials or vascular resistance differentials. Uh, I, to illustrate uh, the effect of compliance on shunting, I've made a relatively crude diagram of the heart. Um, this diagram illustrates the relatively thick-walled left ventricle and a much thinner-walled right ventricle, and two atria with a large atrial septal opening above the ventricles. Now, when blood returns from the lungs and from the body, it has a choice of either stuffing itself into the relatively thick-walled, non-compliant left ventricle, or rather moving into the much more compliant and e more easily filled right ventricle. So in a situation like this, the tendency, of course, is to have left-to-right shunting. This is not based on systemic vascular resistances or pressure gradients, but rather it's based on the differential in um, uh, compliances between the two accepting chambers. Now, shunting can work the other way, however. Uh, babies with critical, so-called critical pulmonary stenosis, have severe narrowing of their pulmonary valve, and in fact they had that uh, in utero. As a result, the right ventricle worked under very high pressure and became considerably thicker and less compliant than normal. So for these patients, and this is true even after they have a balloon valvulotomy, and relief of their severe pulmonary stenosis because the right ventricles are substantially thicker than normal and non-compliant. When blood enters the right atrium from the two vena cava, it tends to move right to left across the patent foramen ovale and into the left atrium. And for this reason, these babies can be quite hypoxemic because of a restriction of filling of the right ventricle and movement of the atrial blood into the left-sided chambers of the heart. Simple mixing. The second reason that red and blue blood can mix is due to simple mixing, and this is simply due to the anatomic configuration of the heart. Let me show two examples of that. Patients with tricuspid atresia have no tricuspid valve or really no right ventricle per se. So all the systemic venous blood that returns to the right atrium has to move across the patent foramen ovale into the left atrium before entering the left ventricle because the, um, the systemic venous blood has to come into contact with the pulmonary venous blood. There's mixing of the two streams. It's unrelated to uh, vascular resistances or compliances. It's simply an anatomic structure of the heart itself that explains it. In the case of truncus arteriosus, uh, there, is, there are two normally formed ventricles, but a large ventricular septal defect, and a single artery that arises from the two ventricles that gives rise to both the aorta and pulmonary artery. In the case of truncus arteriosus, the venous stream uh, mix, it does not mix with the um, pulmonary venous stream, in the atria or ventricles, but as the blood is ejected into this common um, outflow vessel, there's mixing of red and blue blood. So simple mixing at the great vessel level can also result in hypoxemia. Transposition physiology. I should mention that there's actually a third um, uh, reason that patients are cyanotic, and this is so-called transposition physiology. This is the physiology that occurs in patients that have detransposition of the great arteries, sometimes known as detransposition of the great vessels. With detransposition, the aorta arises 
from the right ventricle instead of the left ventricle, and the pulmonary artery arises from the left ventricle instead of uh, from the right ventricle. As a result, as a result, the systemic venous blood returns to the right atrium, goes to the right ventricle, and then is returned immediately to the body without having had a chance to, to uh, participate in any gas exchange in the lungs. Pulmonary venous blood is um, returned to the left atrium, left ventricle, then immediately returned to the lungs without having had a chance uh, to participate in any gas exchange in the peripheral tissues. So a detransposition of the great vessels, if that's the anatomy is it strictly exists at the time of birth, the baby dies very shortly thereafter. There's obviously no oxygen delivery to the tissues. In reality, the vast majority of babies with transposition will have some degree of mixing of blood across the patent foramen ovale and hence will have at least some degree of uh, true uh, gas exchange. That is to say, there'll be some pulmonary venous blood that will find its way to the aorta, and some systemic venous blood that will find its way into the lungs. Uh, but uh, the, the physiology with transposition is characterized primarily by a lack of mixing, not so much uh, commingling of uh, systemic and pulmonary venous blood the way it is with other right-to-left shunting lesions. I should make a final note, and I uh, kind of implied this a bit without saying much about this. In the case of detransposition of the great vessels with transposition physiology, mixing of systemic and pulmonary venous blood are key in terms of determining um, uh, O2 uh, uh, arterial saturation. And in fact, babies with uh, transposition can have a huge amount of pulmonary blood flow, but if very little of that uh, finds its way to the, to the systemic circulation, they can be profoundly hypoxemic. So the issues we've just mentioned in terms of QP to QS are much less important with transposition uh, than mixing of the systemic and pulmonary venous uh, streams. Factors determining arterial oxygen saturation. Okay, so we have a pretty good idea now of the physical basis of hypoxemia with congenital heart defects in a, a qualitative way. But the real question is, what determines the um, arterial saturation in congenital heart disease? It's not enough to simply know why uh, one baby is uh, somewhat bluer than he should be, but you want to know exactly what controls how uh, blue that particular patient will be, which is critical for both the evaluation of the patient as well as the therapy. And I'd like to, to um, divide the factors that are important in determining the uh, arterial oxygen saturation into what you might call front-end factors and back-end factors. And this is um, uh, uh, not the typical way this is discussed, but I think that this actually makes a lot of sense in understanding the physiology. The front-end factors are simple. One is pulmonary venous saturation. And that is pretty obvious. If a baby has lung disease with a congenital cyanotic heart defect, he's going to be bluer than he otherwise would be, all things uh, put together, all things considered. The second is a little bit more complicated, and that is to say the other front-end factor is the ratio of pulmonary to systemic blood flow. Uh, cardiologists abbreviate this QP to QS. Q, of course, stands for flow, and PNS for pulmonary and uh, systemic. And let me illustrate this, uh, if I can, using some relatively crude kind of medical folk art diagrams, you might say, of the heart. What I've drawn here, and we can look at the uh, left upper panel, uh, a heart consisting on the left-hand side of a superior vena cava and the two pulmonary arteries. On the right-hand side of the diagram, two pulmonary veins and the aorta. If you consider the situation in which the amount of blood being returned from the lungs, that is to say fully oxygenated blood, is about half that being returned from the body. That is to say the pulmonary to systemic flow ratio is 0 0.5. And make uh, the calculations, you will see that the, uh, uh, making certain assumptions, the arterial saturation is going to be about 50%. 
And the reason for that's obvious. The large volume of blue blood will tend to dilute out the relatively small volume of red blood, and the saturation is going to be low. If you consider uh, on the upper right-hand panel, however, a QPDQS of 1.0, now there are equal volumes of red and blue blood mixing in the heart. A patient like that now will have an aortic saturation not of 50%, but rather 75% with a pulmonary to systemic, to systemic uh, ratio of two to one, now the aortic saturation would be 86%, and with a massive amount of pulmonary blood flow, uh, uh, with a QP to QS of three to one, the uh, aortic saturation is gonna be about 92%, and in fact, we do see pulmonary to systemic uh, flow ratios fully this high in some patients with, cyan uh, with what uh, are uh, technically cyanotic congenital heart lesions. And so the ratio of flow is extremely important in determining arterial saturations. Now, I should say, and this is a little bit of an arcane point, the exact influence of QP to QS on um, arterial saturation varies a little bit depending upon whether the patient has what we call an admixture lesion. That is to say, we're all pulmonary and systemic blood are mixed together or isolated right to left shunting, as in tetralogy flow. But the basic principle of QP to QS being of uh, prime importance is nevertheless the same. So there are two front end factors. There are basically three back end factors uh, that relate to one thing, and that is to say that systemic venous oxygen saturation is actually very important in a patient with a cyanotic congenital heart defect in determining um, arterial oxygen saturation. As you know, with a normal heart, that's not the case. One can have a very low systemic venous oxygen saturation, but because all the systemic venous uh, blood goes to the lungs before being pumped out to the body, it's really irrelevant to how low the systemic venous saturation is relative to arterial saturation, but that's very different in the case of cyanotic heart defects because the blue blood obviously does mix with the red pulmonary venous blood in order to determine the final arterial saturation. Um, let me illustrate the quantitative importance of this in the following way. Let's assume we have two patients with cyanotic heart disease both of whom have a QP to QS ratio of one, equal volumes of pulmonary and systemic blood flow. If in the first patient, um, the pulmonary venous sat is 100%, that is to say normal or even supernormal, and the systemic venous sat is 60%, this will give this patient, making uh, certain assumptions, an arterial saturation of 80%. If the uh, second patient also has fully uh, saturated pulmonary veins, but the systemic venous saturation is 40 rather than 60%. Now that patient's arterial saturation will be 70%, which is substantially less. And so as you can see, there is actually a considerable influence, again with um, uh, congenital heart disease, uh, uh, on arterial saturations uh, relative to the systemic venous O2 saturation. The explanation for that is actually pretty simple, and I've tried to diagram this here in a very, very crude way by indicating on the left side of this diagram, in red lines, the arterial side of the circulation. On the right-hand side of this cartoon with the blue lines, the venous side of the circulation. And the arrow pointing downward coming off this represents gas exchange in the capillaries. Basically, uh, the principle is simple. If the capillaries suck out a certain fixed amount of oxygen to supply the needs of the tissue, the amount of oxygen that's left over in the systemic uh, venous um, side is going to be determined by how much O2 went into the capillary bed. What determines how much O2 is delivered to the capillary bed? Well, it's very simple. It's two factors. One is oxygen content of the blood which is uh, related to both arterial oxygen saturation and hemoglobin. And the other, of course, is the amount of blood flow into the capillary bed, which is, roughly speaking, cardiac output or systemic blood flow.
And so the greater the amount of systemic blood flow or the higher the amount of O2 content, all other things being equal in terms of O2 consumption, the higher the systemic venous O2 content, also referred to as mixed venous saturation. And so, as you can see, as cardiac output falls, again, given a certain amount of O2 consumption, mixed venous saturation will fall. Will fall. Similarly, if arterial saturations or hemoglobin is uh, less, uh, there will also be less uh, oxygen left over for the systemic venous circuit. Just as importantly, if O2 consumption goes up, and one could imagine this being a clinical uh, relevant factor in a patient who's febrile or in a patient who is uh, very active. If the O2 consumption goes up, all other things being equal, mixed venous um, content uh, will tend to go down. And so the back end factors uh, consist of systemic blood flow, uh, hemoglobin content of the blood, and um, oxygen consumption, also uh, abbreviated VO2. Uh, the reason I think that these are important, and I'll say a little bit more about these in a moment, is that these are all factors to some extent we can control. It can be difficult sometimes to control the pulmonary to systemic flow ratio or even sometimes pulmonary venous saturations. But there are ways to modify systemic flow, uh, hematocrit, and O2 consumption that can be very helpful. Finally, and we're near the end of this uh, part of the lecture, it's important to note that arterial oxygen saturation is really only part of the story, of course. Oxygen delivery to the tissues is ultimately what counts. One could have a perfectly uh, normal arterial oxygen saturation, but if cardiac output were markedly depressed, uh, a patient can obviously die of tissue dysoxia. And so it's very important to think not only in terms of arterial saturation, but O2 delivery to the tissues. O2 delivery is uh, the equation that describes oxygen delivery to the tissues is very simple. It's basically delivery equals um, content of uh, arterial content of oxygen, which is related to both the pulmonary venous oxygen saturation as well as hemoglobin, and uh, systemic blood flow, which is in a normal uh, person, in a normal heart, uh, cardiac output. Uh, this is a diagram that roughly illustrates a normal separated four-chambered uh, heart and the um, uh, O2 delivery of relationships. The situation is considerably more complex in patients with cyanotic heart disease and in particular patients that have uh, single ventricles. And the reason for that is that the fundamental O2 delivery equation changes. It does not. Delivery of O2 is identical in the sense that it's uh, the amount of blood delivered to the system, uh, systemic circulation times the um, O2 content of the blood is what delivers, is what determines O2 delivery. But the reason that things are more complicated in single ventricle patients is that every drop of blood that the ventricle pumps out has a choice of either going to the body or to the lungs. And the ventricle is not an infinite uh, is not a pump of infinite capacity. A single ventricle pump has the same uh, limitations as any other ventricle. And so once the uh, single ventricle is pumped as much as it can pump, um, there will be a limitation on systemic blood flow uh, related to the amount of blood flow that finds its way into the lungs rel uh, rather than the body. And I've tried to emphasize this in the lower right-hand part of the diagram with single ventricles, systemic blood flow isn't just the total amount of blood pumped by the heart, it isn't simply cardiac output, but it's cardiac output minus pulmonary blood flow. A number of years ago, there was an investigator by the name of Ofer Barnea who, uh, who said, listen, this is a relatively complex relationship we're talking about here. I know that as QP to QS, gets to be higher, oxygen saturations go up. But I also know that as QP to QS uh, gets to be higher, given a fixed maximum cardiac output, there'll be less uh, blood going to the tissues. And therefore, the relationship between QP to QS uh, 
and O2 delivery is relatively complex. So what Barnea did is he wrote a computer program and he, and he modeled basically a patient with a single ventricle. He assumed a certain amount of O2 consumption uh, by the patient that had that single ventricle. And he asked the computer to spit out a series of curves uh, relating the pulmonary to systemic flow ratio to systemic O2 availability, which is the same as O2 delivery. Uh, in order to determine where the sweet spot is in terms of maximal O2 delivery. And uh, this graph actually shows uh, four curves uh, that are, um, relate to differing uh, cardiac outputs, assumed cardiac outputs, total amount of blood that's pumped by the heart, and relate uh, O2 availability on the y-axis, which again is the same thing as O2 delivery, and QPDQS. And what Barnea found actually is that uh, as one increases the QP to QS much above one, uh, 0.5 to 1, to 1 uh, O2 delivery actually tends to fall. What I've done is added a red circle to his graph. Uh, it roughly the uh, region of cardiac uh, output, normal cardiac output for a 3 kilo baby. And as you can see, the maximal O2 delivery actually occurs with what we would consider to be a relatively low QP to QS. Now, I think our clinical experience would indicate that this curve may be a little bit left shifted. That is to say that Barnea might suggest that a QP to QS as low as 0 0.5 to 1 would represent maximal O2 delivery. I think most people's sense is that it's probably somewhat greater than 0.5, maybe closer to 1 to 1. But the point I'm trying to make here is that as pulmonary uh, flow goes up substantially above one, although the arterial saturation gets better for the baby, the O2 delivery actually tends to fall. And this is really the explanation for why patients with single ventricle lesions that have unrestricted pulmonary blood flow need to be treated in a way that tends to restrict rather than encourage pulmonary blood flow. And I'll say more about that in the second part of this series. Treatment therapies. So what are the therapeutic implications of the physiology we've dis just discussed? Well, the first is that one has to have a pretty accurate diagnosis and understanding of what the patient has. For example, a patient with persistent pulmonary hypertension as the newborn will be treated with a pulmonary vasodilator, for example, inhaled nitric oxide, and general supportive majors, maybe up to and including extracorporeal membrane oxygenation if required, in order to allow the baby to basically recover from the high pulmonary resistance. On the other hand, a patient with detransposition of the great vessels who requires atrial level mixing in order to have adequate arterial saturations will oftentimes require a balloon atrial septostomy. Again, we will discuss this subsequently. Uh, sometimes prostaglandin E1 in order to maintain ductal uh, opening can be uh, helpful in these patients, but not always. And uh, balloon septostomy is really definitive therapy or definitive palliation for many patients. On the other hand, a baby with tetralogy flow with relatively mild tetralogy flow and only modest arterial hypoxemia may require no therapy as a newborn. If the degree of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction is more severe, it may be um, uh, palliated by keeping the ductus open with prostaglandin E1. Or alternatively, if the patient doesn't have a ductus or the ductus is closed and can't be opened again, increasing systemic vascular resistance in a patient like that to force blood essentially across the restrictive opening between the ventricle and pulmonary artery may be useful. Finally, a patient with a single uh, ventricle lesion without pulmonary stenosis, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, in a patient like that, you may want to avoid maneuvers that de decrease pulmonary vascular resistance as, as a, an important part of his therapeutic regimen. The second therapeutic implication is that pretty much regardless of the defect, systemic blood flow, hemoglobin levels, and O2 consumption are really critical in determining whether or not uh, the baby has adequate O2 delivery. These are variables, as I mentioned before, that we have ways of modifying 
And as long as we keep this in the back of our mind when dealing with a severely hypoxemic patient, it will give us things that we can do that can, even if they don't address the root cause of the hypoxemia, can be extremely useful in maintaining an adequate uh, O2 delivery. Uh, so this uh, concludes the lecture on the physiology of uh, uh, cyanosis and especially related to cyanotic congenital heart defects. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback. What did or didn't you like about this video? Was the content too simple, just right, or too difficult? Was the length too short, just right, or too long? Any additional comments? You can either click the Start a New Discussion button and type in feedback or send us an email at openpediatrics at childrens.harvard.edu. Note, feedback is not required to complete this activity in the Guided Learning Pathway.